I wish to clearly state that I'm innocent and a victim of political machinations. to this conversation, free speech, where we are partnering with Frederick Newman Foundation in Zimbabwe, uh, FNF, who are bringing us this episode uh, together with Heart and Soul TV and radio, where we are going to be discussing the effect of corruption against free speech. Now, in the past few months, we have seen the number of arrests on people who have been uh, speaking against government and speaking against corruption that have been arrested and jailed uh, before trial and have struggled to get um, a bail. And on the other hand, we have seen a government that has said that it is not against free speech. In fact, they have said that in the new dispensation, they are open to free speech and they are actively promoting free speech. In fact, they say that there's a departure from the past. I'm joined in studio via uh, Zoom by award-winning journalist, an investigative uh, journalist and uh, filmmaker, uh, Hopol, Hopol Chingono. Now, Hopol Chingono has had, um, has had it rough in the hands of the new dispensation. He has been arrested uh, three times uh, in the past uh, few months, and he has spent a total of around 80 days in Chikurubi, maximum um, uh, prison and this in his view and from what we have gathered the evidence that is there is that he's been arrested for exercising free speech and attacking uh, corruption now welcome Opal to this program thank you very much for having me I'm also joined by Alexander Rusero. Now, Alexander Rusero is a lecturer. He, uh, we, we met when he was still at Harare Poli where he was taking journalism school. Now he's heading a university in Mutare and is now currently based in Mutare. Um, he has extensive experience in journalism and he has been um, taking most of the students or the people that are in practice in journalism right now under his stewardship. Now, thank you very much, Alex, and, uh, and welcome. Thank you, um, Blessed. Uh, the, 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 the journalism program in, in, Mtari, in, in Mtari is, is yet to start. Uh, I, I was just instrumental way back in trying to, to also bring journalism in, in Manikaland. I'm sure it will start soon because I, I am told uh, everything sailed through Zimche in terms of the curriculum that I helped put in place. Uh, it is, we just hope uh, diversity of our training of journalism uh, to all provinces will also help in terms of uh, tackling corruption, uh, the discourses we are going to deliberate uh, in this uh, critical juncture. But um, specifically, I'm here as, as, as a media analyst. You know, we can be controversial on these platforms, and when they are associated with our workplaces, tomorrow you'll be called in the VC's office. We are talking of freedom of speech. Uh, academic freedom is also problematic in Zimbabwe, you know. <laughs> so <laughs> we have to make a disclaimer that. Uh, we, we are not spokespersons of the institutions that we come from, the various universities that we teach. We, we are participants of national discourse as, 
courageous citizens uh, who also yearn for a better society in Zimbabwe. Amazing. So uh, the, the aspect of courage as we, as we delve in has just opened. But Hopewell, I'll start with you. Can you just, in your view, the topic under consideration, free speech under threat from corruption. What is your view when uh, interacting with this topic? Uh, well, the problem that we have in Zimbabwe is uh, the world is seen in my cases where I was persecuted for basically exposing corruption is that the corrupt are the ones that have uh, power. Uh, they have state power, they have access to state institutions. They can use those institutions like they did in my case uh, to throw you into prison, to get you arrested at uh, using trumped up charges and that in a way stops journalists from doing their work because a lot of journalists that I speak to, they say that sometimes they feel afraid, they feel threatened, uh, they are worried about the repercussions um, that will uh, visit them if they say certain things that they would have uncovered whilst doing their work as journalists. So the corrupt are powerful and they will do anything possible to stop uh, the media from uncovering corrupt relations, corrupt deals, the looting of public funds, the plundering of the nation's natural resources, because this has a direct consequence to the suffering of our people. It is important for the media to cover it. So the fact that the corrupt are fighting back, it stifles uh, the, the, the media space, it stifles the right for the state, uh, to, for, the, for the media, I mean, to engage with citizens so that they can be informed in order to make the right decisions um, in, in their interaction with public affairs. Uh, amazing, but in, in your view, do you, do you think that free speech right now in Zimbabwe is under threat? Yes, uh, free speech in Zimbabwe is under threat. Um, my second arrest in September centered around my exposure of a corrupt arrangement that had been done uh, by Hendrita Shwaya, President Nangagos niece, who was caught at the airport with six kilograms of uh, gold. And there was a corrupt arrangement that was done with the National Prosecution Authority um, that it will not oppose her bail. When I exposed that, I was arrested and I spent 19 days in prison. And yet in a normal society, I should have been applauded for exposing that corruption. And indeed, after that exposure, the court that was uh, sitting and hearing the case ruled that it was not a proper arrangement, but I was thrown into prison. So that shows you that the corrupt are powerful, they use their mighty uh, and their access to controlling state institutions to persecute journalists who are doing their work. Mm. Uh, Alex, your, your, your considered view, is a free speech in Zimbabwe under threat from the high mighty who are corrupt? Yeah, I think uh, Zimbabwe, what we are seeing in the post Mugabe era is a, is a delicate balance, uh, a delicate balance of uh, entrenching authoritarianism uh, at the same time where the government is also in desperate need to, to, to exhibit a posture of a government that is opening up, of a government that is embracing the dictates of uh, the 20th century Western liberal uh, democracy issues to do with freedom of speech, freedom of association. That's why you also have uh, the Transitional National Stabilization Program, the TSP, uh, which was also anchored on issues to do with openness, on issues to do with access to information, which then informed basically why you you also we, we, we witnessed the repealing of IPA, for example, the repealing of 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 POSA. So the, the government is playing a delicate balance. But when you encroach on the nerve centers of power, like what uh, Brother Opwell did, uh, the, the 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 government is a uh, estival mood. The government is best way of doing things are uh, then witnessed in terms of pouncing on you. So what the government is giving on with the left hand, it is also taking with the right hand. On one hand, you have a whole government 
that is uh, exhibiting itself as a part of virtue as much as a freedom of speech is contained, freedom of the media. But on the other, you also have the same government. So it's like an internal contradiction, but it's deliberate. It, it, it's a stage managed process where it looks like there are internal contradictions in ZANPF, where there is a certain formation that is liberal, that is for progress. And there is a hardliner approach that does not like things. So that's why you have a whole major street court. It throws somebody in remand prison. You have a whole high court which dismisses even the logic behind the arrest in the first place. So those internal contradictions tells you that a government is not yet ready uh, in terms of embracing freedom of speech because by and large, uh, competitive authoritarian regimes of which the Mnangagwa government is one, they are very obvious to media freedom because media freedom does not only create an open society. For authoritarians, it also threatens their power. And yeah, but, uh, you know- But Alex, uh, some have argued that the, there are lots of journalists in the country and they've not been arrested. Uh, they've arrested journalists that they view um, are now turning into politics. That's a, that's a baseless and illiterate uh, accusation, uh, uh, blessed. Journalists are political animals. Journalists are also activists because you are, active, you, are, you, you are advocating for the common good of the society. You are advocating for something that is a virtue in the society. You, you look at a, a typical example, blessed, what is happening down south across. You have a whole former president still being dragged to court up to this day. You have a whole commission of inquiry, the Zondo Commission, set courtesy of the works originally of journalists who exposed the abuses of power, which they alleged led to state capture. But now in Zimbabwe, the problem is that there is an organic link between power and corruption. Power is actually the passport. It's the gateway, the access to any form of corruption in Zimbabwe. You do not have the, 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 the corrupt on one side of things, then the powerful on the other. You have a potipori, a mix. You are either corrupt and powerful, or you are not powerful and you are not corrupt. That's, that, that, that's the contradiction. Like what uh, Brother Opel rightly puts, the powerful are the most corrupt in Zimbabwe. And uh, the moment then you try to encroach on their path, they then frame a narrative where you are not an enemy of corruption, but you are an enemy of the state. Yet speaking, any effort, speaking of, blessed... Speaking of, speaking of the enemy of the state, Hopo, do you believe that you have been declared an enemy of the state? Well, the, 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 the behavior of the state points towards that. Um, but, but like... Uh, um, the, 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 what, how you characterized it in the question, the original question, uh, that journalists are going into politics, it's wrong because journalists are in politics every day. We report about politics. Corruption yes. is a politics of resources that are misappropriated and resulting in people uh, having to fail to get access to education, access to medical care, having potholes, failing to get access to water. That is all politics. But of course, the state would like to characterize us in such a way, but in propaganda terms. Um, the, the, the job of the journalist is to hold the political elites to account. So our lives are intertwined with those of the political elites. And um, of course, when you start attacking journalists and throwing them into prison for simply doing their job, we are declaring them enemies of state, but of a corrupt state. Generally, states don't declare uh, is not hide, but it's only those states which, which have something to hide, which declare journalists as enemies of the state. Amazing, but. Why, why do you think that the people who are working at the Zimbabwe Independent, for instance, who have written about corruption have not been arrested and you are being the one who's being targeted and persecuted? Well, I think you uh, remember because you were at a press conference where the whole ZANU-PF party rolled out a press conference with its spokesperson, uh, Patrick Chinamasa, 
And he says that I was unscrupulous because I had uh, talked about the president's family. So that's the reason why I was arrested. It was quite clear because ZANPF did not hide it. They actually rolled out a press conference. And I remember you were asking him at the press conference whether he understood the issues that were at play at drugs and he didn't understand. But what he understood was the order that he was given that he should come out and attack me. And you must remember that when the drugs uh, and, 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 and the, the looting of public funds meant for COVID-19 came out, they were, only two journalists that really went into the story and packing it. The others talked about it in passing and the, none of Zimbabwe's newspapers uh, unpacked the story the way that I did and the way that Mdudu uh, Matutu did. And indeed when uh, I was arrested, Mdudu went on the run because they were after him as well. His uh, nephew was um, abducted and tortured um, on account of them looking for Duduse. So I think it's it's wrong to say that the Zimbabwe Independent is a uh, journalist are not being a, a, a arrested. It's because they've not covered those stories in a way that the powerful felt threatened. In this case, it was the case of uh, me being accused of, as it were, embarrassing the, pres the president's family. And they actually wrote a press release saying that I was unscrupulous and that I was uh, dragging the president into uh, this affair. That is why I was arrested. Do, do you think, as you speak about um, other main media uh, not reporting on these issues in, a, in that manner that you speak of, do you think that the media in Zimbabwe is being fair to the public in that way of tackling or reporting on corruption? Well, the, the, the local media in Zimbabwe could do much more um, in exposing corruption, but I get the sense that some of them are, are, are compromised. Um, some of them are afraid to report on these issues. If you look at the daily news of today, it's different from the daily news of 20 years ago. It has clearly been co-opted into um, reporting favorably regardless of the circumstances, but reporting favorably about the state and to a point where some of the reporting it borders on lies. And, and so you wouldn't expect such a publication to focus on issues to do with corruption when they affect uh, the people that it seems to be in bed with at the moment. And then you have newspapers like the Zimbabwe Independent. Uh, they have been reporting on corruption um, but the real problem is that there is no access to these publications for the general public. Whereas my reporting was different that I used social media, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, and WhatsApp and Telegram. And so my reporting was um, widely available to the citizens. I looked at the states at the time, at the height of the uh, COVID-19 uh, looting scandal, about 1.3 million people uh, read what I was putting out in combine, combining all the states from my social media platforms. So the state is aware of this, that more people have access to social media than they have to traditional media. So sometimes you'd find that a story is written by a publication like the Zimbabwe Independent, but the assessment that the state does is how many people have access to this uh, publication. That's why you send it around tweets. It knows that people are reading Twitter much more than what is put in traditional media. And when it goes onto Twitter, it then shared into WhatsApp groups, it goes to Telegram, it's on Facebook, it's on Instagram. So that is why we have become targets and that is why they are worried about social media. Uh, Alex, just uh, a few weeks ago, the vice president, um, the former vice president of the Second Republic, uh, Kembo Mohadi, came out and issued a statement that um, directly uh, um, uh, appeared to be attacking Zim Live, uh, which had reported an issue of corrupt abuse of power in a sex scandal. And he threatened to go after, after after uh, Zim Live, uh, headed by Mdudu Matutu, and also said that 
um, his enemies were using the media to fight him. Now, in the context of what we are speaking about, free speech under threat from the corrupt, uh, what would be your comment on that particular first uh, press conference by the vice president? I think the challenge confronting Zimbabwe uh, across the political divide is that shame is no space uh, in the political discourse of the day. You can indulge in shameful acts as a leader and you get away with it. So it, that, that's why it is making news uh, for Campbell to have resigned, especially after some spirited resistance. I'm very sure behind the scenes, somebody whispered in his ear to say, comrade, uh, you cannot go, you cannot no longer cross this line, it's no longer viable. Otherwise, there wasn't any need for that uh, Brazen uh, press statement that he issued prior to the resignation one, uh, where he was talking of detractors, because the detractors are not the one uh, who actually put these pens down. You you do not move around, blessed, with an open zip and shut mind. And and when you are caught uh, near the red ended, you then cry victim. You cry issues. You must have a sense of shame. But unfortunately, in Zimbabwe's body politic. People lie, people steal, people indulge in these uh, sexual escapades and get away with it. They always cry victim uh, at the end of the day. Why? Because uh, we live in an era where leaders, especially from ZANPF, uh, they still relieve the horrors of the Pravda, the horrors of uh, the Soviet Union uh, media approach where the media is used for character ass assassination. But in this regard, it's about responsibility. And um, Dudus actually should be applauded for, for, for reminding the people that journalism can still make a difference. Uh, the likes of Koko Chingono should be applauded to remind the people that are uh, contrary to, to the fallacies peddled in the society that the media no longer matters, et cetera. Journalists who are committed to do their work even if they do not give, get money, even if they have limited resources, they can impact life. So the whole episode of the resignation of Ukembo Mohad recently, and in the S2, well, even the firing of Obadiah Moyo as a health minister, they are very indicative of the potential that journalism in Zimbabwe have, that the void that journalism can actually fill to, 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 to reclaim its space as the fourth estate, especially under the current circumstances of a paralyzed parliament, under the circumstances of a weakened civil society, under the circumstances where activists are all under siege. The only escape route in the current state of nature we find ourselves in is actually in journalism. Journalism being the to to torch beer. I, I have given you the, 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 the state capture uh, typical case in South Africa, the Panama case uh, where it, it exposed a lot of corruption uh, all over the world, uh, for example. Uh, all those are actions and activities of journalists. So in light of uh, a you, you, sp you speak of journalism yes. being uh, the bulwark of 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 uh, of defense for the people of Zimbabwe, but um, some have argued that journalism has become so polarized that um, they we we are actually as useless as the political side that we support. I don't think so, but I think is ZANPF has successfully managed to create a polarized uh, society in Zimbabwe. ZANPF is complicit. Uh, from 2000 uh, to the onset, blessed, the binary characterization of citizens has been retrogressive. You are either blessed Mshlanga, a patriot, or you are an enemy. Being an enemy means you oppose ZANPF. But without diversity, we do not go anywhere. Even polarization, there is nothing wrong with, with being polarized. For example, for as long, sorry, for as long as we converge on issues of national question, but the framing of the national question in Zimbabwe has been distorted. Day in, day out, the likes of Opochimona are telling you that no, 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 it's the it's the, the 
the corruption question, that's the national question that has crippled governance. But ZANPF will come in defense and tell you it's the sanctions question. Uh, just like in the S2L, it was the land question on the part of ZANPF. Civil society and the MDC were saying, no, it's the human rights and governance question. But we cannot rule out co corruption in the mix. You cannot have a company that is formed three weeks uh, prior to, to being awarded a tender of running to millions of dollars, a company within without a website domain. And when those things are, are, are thrown in the public, Frey, then you are labeled unpatriotic. Uh, and we also have a crisis, which is not of media, blessed. It's a generational and as well as a national crisis. We have a crisis of consciousness. Where the moment you repeatedly question these things, you 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 see and you hear people are even asking, good, okay, Maria Gabi was nebasare. You know, what, oh, how how have we reached that level where we cease to care about national leaders looting, national leaders stealing? So it, I don't subscribe to the idea that journalists are useless, but I subscribe to the idea of media capture, where the media is crippled, has deliberately been captured by the powerful who are also corrupt, the powerful corrupt elite. They have captured media because they have foreseen the potential of the media in as much as exposing them and disturbing their shenanigans is concerned. And you must also recall that outside issues of capture, we also have problems of uh, self-censorship in journalism, where there are discourses of uno nudes, wa, ino pisa, etc. Those cliches, you, you know them, you know them, blessed. I, I, I myself, I was at the daily news between 2011 and 2013. You know, there were actually some agents planted in newsrooms where a story which is supposed to be page one tomorrow of a certain minister having done something, the minister would call the editor and Dr. Zirei Stanley, I know tomorrow I'm in your, in your press. Meaning somewhere, somehow, someone amongst the editorial would also be an informer, his complicity is compromised, is in the pockets of the very same uh, corrupt people. So. I think it's a balance. We, we might not relegate the media's functions, but it's all issues to do with the, the political, economic environment, which has led journalists to be success, susceptible to capture, uh, to be very self-centered, and also to live in fear. Because when you have selected application of justice where one journalist in courts writes something and is left and when another like Opel does the same uh, and is used as a whip by the state to demonstrate that if you go this route that's how we deal with you it's a, it's a whole mixed bag of intelligence at play here so that at the end of the day we are rendered useless as journalists or as the media but uh, yeah. you also have to understand economic yeah, Opal, I want to come to the threat also by the vice president. I want to come to you there. Um, this has been a weapon uh, rather used against journalists um, where journalists are threatened with lawsuits. They are actually threatened with arrests. Uh, in this instance, maybe you can comment uh, on what, how you view the threat that came from the vice president in the first instance and then his resignation. Well, it was quite evident from the onset that the threat was just an empty threat because um, what had been put out uh, by Zim Live was quite clear that it was him who was talking in those uh, um, video, in, in, those, in those audio clips. And um, <clears throat> the last person that I remember, the last politician that I remember who successfully sued uh, a newspaper when he sued the Herald was uh, Edson Zobo. And uh, even though we have a, a, a suspect judiciary at the moment, I don't think that one could go to court to sue about uh, audio, audio, audio clips that are, are, are quite evident because one has to prove that it's not him. And when you go to a court of law, a lot more has to come out. And, and, and I don't think he was going to do that. It was just a threat. Uh, the biggest threat that we have at the moment is the political threat where uh, state institutions are used against journalists who are exposing corruption through the criminal justice system, where 
you are arrested. For instance, when I was arrested on the 8th of January, I was arrested for something that I actually didn't do. I never tweeted about a policeman killing a child. I was arrested using a law that does not exist. It's unconstitutional to do so. But the court, the lower court said that it was constitutional, which shows the capture of uh, you get bail, which means bail has been weaponized. You only get bail when you go to the high court. The central question that should be asked by lawyers and by citizens who really care about the rule of law is, why is it each time people are being arrested, they're not getting bail at the magistrate's court? Why is it they're getting bail at the high court? Those questions are not being asked. Um, and but they should be asked. So that is part of the uh, repression infrastructure that is used by the state to try and stop us from doing our work. Otherwise- Why, why, why have they failed to stop you? How, how have they failed to stop you? Because you've, you've continued. I'm, I'm just doing my work. Um, you know, there are many ways of stopping people. They either negotiate with you, bring you into bed, like what they did with the daily news. Uh, people are stopped in many different ways. And um, in my case, I'm just doing my work and I believe in what I'm doing. Uh, that's why I have not stopped exposing corruption because it's a constitutional uh, right. It's something that the government should be uh, uh, supporting. In, a, in normal circumstances, the government should actually be uh, supporting me. The president should have been applauding what I'm doing. And, but the fact that they are not doing so, the fact that they attack me for exposing corruption, it tells you more about them than it does about us as journalists. Just, just as um, last week when the Zinasu uh, students and, and Joanna Mamombe stood just outside the Harari Magistrates Court and delivered a statement, and most of them now are, are struggling for bail. What is your view um, on that incident in terms of the free speech and, and corruption? Well, we have to go to our constitution. Our constitution allows citizens to speak as long as they are not infringing on the rights of others, as long as they are not uh, 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 participating in unlawful activities. So one would have to ask that if somebody goes and uh, makes a solidarity statement uh, in support of their colleague, is that really uh, breaking the law? The fact that they are then arrested and they are denied bail, again, it tells you more about the state of repression in the country. It tells you more about the intolerance of the state when it comes to issues to do with freedom of speech. Uh, just like we are not allowed to protest, yet the constitution clearly says that citizens have a right to go and protest against their government, to bring issues to the fore and let their government know that they are unhappy about certain uh, 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 things that are happening in public life. But in Zimbabwe, you're not able to do so, which means that the government itself is not following the constitution. It does not respect the rule of law because it throws journalists into prison for exposing corruption as it blatantly did in my case when I was arrested in Zimbabwe in, in, a, in a September for exposing that in Rita Rishwaya, the niece of the president had been granted a deal where the state was not going to oppose bail, something that was corrupt and something that was confirmed by the court that it was not appropriate. And it actually happened. It actually happened. It, it came to pass. What Exactly what I say uh, is, is what happened. And you were arrested for having had the information in advance. I was arrested. I was denied bail. I was thrown into Chikurubi maximum prison. I spent 19 days there. Amazing. Now, here at F FNF and Heart and Soul TV and Radio, we believe in the public participation. And we also believe that free speech is very critical for the development of the nation. And we bring you this uh, program, Free Talk, um, together with uh, Frederick Newman uh, Foundation and Heart and Soul TV and Radio. Now, I'm going to be asking those in the gallery who have questions or contributions towards uh, to Hopo or Alex uh, to come through. So if you have a question, you can just put your hand up and I will allow you to, to engage. Um, but uh, Alex, let us talk about the shrinking of, um, of 
the civic society. Now you had an issue where Zimlife brought out this corrupt, alleged, blatant, uh, corrupt and uh, use of, of authority. And uh, not even a single civil society, I think it was only one uh, women's group we lead that uh, came up on Twitter uh, condemning such, but the rest were silent. Uh, what does this say about our society? Yeah, two things there, blessed. Uh, firstly, it's about fear. Uh, you know, we, we all know the, the government that we are dealing with. We all know what it is capable of doing and how it can go for broke uh, when it decides to. We all know what has happened uh, in the past. So at times it's a, it's a modicum of fear that is still engulfs uh, in a lot of uh, civil society operations. And by the way, civil society, they also remain vulnerable because uh, their existentiality, their operations, somehow, somehow also depends heavily on government consent and permission for them to continue. Otherwise, the government, the government can actually choose to deregister them uh, if, if it chooses to do so. We, we have seen certain pleas uh, on Twitter uh, by certain activists sympathetic to, to the government to say we need to deregister this, we need to, to dismiss this embassy from operating in Zimbabwe, etc. It, it tells you the thinking uh, that we have uh, in, the, in the context. Uh, then another issue outside the uh, issues of uh, fear, blessed, uh, the, uh, there are issues to do with uh, political embedment. A lot of civil society, they are not as clean as they purport or they appear to be. They are heavily also politically embedded. So at times they, they, they would just say, what will I lose at the end of the day if I just choose to keep quiet? They also have a selective uh, activism approach. If it's uh, matters concerning this person or that person, we hear their voice loud and clear. If it's about this or that person, they are silent. They pretend as if nothing has happened. So in Zimbabwe, we have a crisis of fear. We have also a crisis of selective uh, activism on the part of the civil society. We even have selected uh, uh, Twitter visim, uh, so to speak, where suppose you are not Opo Chingono, who is known, who has made a name for himself, who will bother tweet for you when you are jailed, when you are incarcerated, you, you can actually rot in jail. The same people who are vocal when certain personalities. So those are some of the issues that we need to, to come out clearly and openly to say. We have a charade of a civil society in Zimbabwe, which chooses to advocate uh, for certain things, to lobby for certain things, maybe because it comes with money. But when it comes to issues to do with a whole vice president having molested, imagine the, the level of trauma, imagine the level of stigma to the families that have been affected and that have permanently been affected uh, by the immoral tendencies at the highest office of the land in form of uh, vice president's office. It tells you uh, the level where we are as a citizen in comprehending what matters to us as a society, what, what is good for us as Zimbabwe. Yes, um, thank you. Mo Moses, uh, I'll, I'll allow you to, to come in. I, I saw your hand up. All right, uh, thank you. Um, I feel honored to be amongst you, fellow nationalists. I am from, uh, I'm, I'm a student at, at African University actually, uh, an international relations student. So I'm always behind all these things. Um, I, I had a question which is directed to Mr. Hopo Shingwono there. Say, what is your tech or what is your comment concerning uh, the comments that you are actually an agent of the West and that you don't really represent the interests of Zimbabweans here. Um, you are only pushing for your own personal gains and uh, you are really funded by the Westerners or the outsiders. What's your comment on that? Because it seems as if no really uh, media houses probably uh, confronted you on that. What's your take on the claims that you are an agent of the West as purported by the ruling class here? Hopo? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, it is quite ludicrous for anyone to accuse me of being a Western puppet or a Western pawn for exposing corruption. 
The people that are suffering because of corruption are ordinary Zimbabweans, not Westerners. We, we have lost six doctors in the past 30, 40 days because they were not well equipped with COVID-19 uh, personal protective equipment. And this is a direct consequence of the looting of public funds meant for COVID that are exposed in, in, in May, June, July last year. And so if you look at Chinoy Hospital, 66 uh, nurses and doctors tested positive to COVID-19 because they are not well equipped. They are not given the right equipment. They don't even have the right masks to use. So when Hopewell Chimono then exposes that this money was taken by Obediah Moyo in conjunction with drugs, and someone says, you are a Western puppet for exposing that. It, it just shows you the stupidity of that person who's saying so. <laughs> Why would the West pay me to expose corruption which is affecting citizens of Zimbabwe and not Western citizens. I'm talking about things that affect our people every day. I'm talking about 2,500 women, Zimbabwean women who are dying every, every year trying to give birth, simply because the government is not invested in maternity theaters. The biggest hospital in Zimbabwe, Harare Hospital, has got only two maternity theaters that were built in 1977 by Ian Smith, they are not working at the moment. Does that make me a Western puppet to point that out? We don't have uh, water going into our homes in townships. People are dying from cholera. It is a fact that government political elites are driving four by fours. Does pointing that out make me a Western puppet? So that's why you find that the majority of the people laugh at those accusations because they don't mean anything which is sensible. They are, they are irrational. When I point out that our youths do not have jobs, you must reform and follow the rule of law so that investors can come, investment will not come, whether it's local or foreign, to a country which does not respect the rule of law to a country where you don't know how you can move your money out if you want to buy spare parts for your, for your factories. Does saying so make me a Western puppet? Does saying that a Zimbabwean child in rural areas should be able to aspire to become a professor of medicine, does that make me a Western puppet? Amazing. Um, I've got John, John Masuku. John Masuku is a veteran um, a broadcaster and journalist uh, is on the line. Is, uh, go on, John. Thank you very much, uh, Ntlanga. Uh, good to see you, Hopewell and uh, Alex. Uh, Hopewell, I mean, maybe, let me start with Alex since Hopewell has just finished talking. But uh, Alex, so what next? What should we do uh, you know, under the circumstances as journalists so that we are much more effective, uh, so that we actually help uh, to change things so that our work has got impact. Because as it is, uh, you know, because of fear, uh, because of the circumstances that we find ourselves in, our work at the end of the day does not have the desired impact. So you as a journalism trainer would, and also a political scientist would want you to assist us there. And in your case, Hopewell, uh, each time I listen to news bulletins, you are always referred to as an activist, and you are no longer, especially on the state media, you are no longer referred to as a, a journalist because uh, it is saying that you actually participate. You, you, you don't report things as they are, but you are a participant. Uh, at one time, I think what they used to cite is that you were saying uh, parties should actually demonstrate and change government. And in, in so doing, you were no longer practicing journalism, but you were now a politician, you are now an activist. Uh, those are my two questions. Amazing, thank you. Uh, Alex? Thank you, Mkoma John. Uh, good to see you. You know, only this morning I was actually watching, uh, viewing your photos on Facebook to say, Mkoma John, I don't know what made me think of you this morning. <laughs> right, um, in terms of uh, what needs to be done, yeah, I'm, I'm also a terrible optimist of things, uh, but uh, that optimism should also not blind us. I think there are a lot of... Uh, low-hanging fruits 
And the greatest law hanging fruit that we have is actually the exposés of corruption. It does not take any money. It does not need any resources to know who is stealing what. You, what you simply need for most of the time uh, is actually issues to do with courage. We, we, we have to invest in courage. Unfortunately, we do not have a curriculum in Zimbabwe all over uh, which, which talks of uh, journalists or train them to be courageous. We also do not have any way you find in the journalism training in Zimbabwe which talks about passion. Those are the critical weapons that are required in as much as changing the journalism's uh, approach uh, is concerned. I think we, we, we also have to invest a lot in terms of investigative journalism in Zimbabwe. The current dire predicament in Zimbabwe, Mkoma John, is where we cannot go beyond uh, five Ws and an H. Our journalism it de was deliberately structured and attached to the post-colonial pan-Africanist infrastructure of it being a, an institutional based reportage of the president was donating this, the president has visited this, etc. It's events-based journalism. We have not moved from events-based journalism to issues-based journalism. So it's still strange that 41 years after independence, exposing corruption uh, still appears to be strange in the ears and eyes of the government to the extent that it's, it's not acceptable, to the extent that they have to throw uh, the Wopo Chimonos in jail. It tells you that we are also lacking in terms of our training. Uh, between 2019 and 2020, I did a, a whole research which was commissioned by FOIA Media Institute and the international media support on the status of investigative journalism in Zimbabwe. And the, 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 the findings of that research is that investigative journalism in Zimbabwe is close to a non-event in as much as real investment in, in investigative journalism is concerned. I think we need a middle career training institute that retrains and recapacitates uh, journalists. In Zimbabwe, we also lack specialized journalism. Uh, you are just moved in Koma John from a sports desk tomorrow, you are on entertainment desk. In the next day, you are reporting elections when it's election time. When it's World Cup, everybody becomes a, a, a sports reporter, etc. That is a wrong approach. So, we are just monkey doers, monkey seers, in as much as our journalism practice uh, is, is concerned. But we also have to capitalize on the fact that the current government led by Emerson Mnangagwa wants to be seen to be doing something outside. Yes, they might have some hidden, some subtle ways to stifle, but we have to capitalize on the posture uh, that they want to portray of a new dispensation that is desperate for, for re-engagement. So it, it was never their choice to repeal IPA or to repeal POSA. It was out of pressure. That actually also comes from journalists from civil society. Those are some of the law hanging fruits. We also have a rich constitution that safeguards the rights. But at the times, we have not yet reached a situation where people are conscious of the constitution and their rights. I think the greatest net cost of constitutionalism in Zimbabwe is also associated to the transformation of the NCA from being a constitutional lobby group uh, to a political party. We need a constitutional lobby group that is active in capacitating the people, the citizens, in terms of their constitutional rights. We do not have that. Everyone seems to be in politics to the extent that when you are outside the politics and talk of these things, you are now labeled an activist to say, a uh, journalist become activist. It's so embarrassing to, to, to listen to such kind of uh, cliches as we listen to them on public. Amazing. Um, Hopo? No, thank you very much, uh, Mr. John Masuku. I must uh, uh, throw in a caveat there that my, 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 my first uh, uh, job in journalism and broadcast journalism, I was given by Mr. Masuku when I, he gave me an internship at the old Radio One at Zimbabwe Broadcasting Corporation in 1992. So someone I've known for, for that long. Um, and what I want to say, uh, Mr. Masuku, to, to, to what you put across to me is that all these 
uh, things are said in order to try and taint my reputation. And they, are, they hope that when my reputation is tainted, then everything that I say is tainted as well. What I'm saying affects that I'm putting on the table and I'm putting evidence. I'll give an example of the drugs issue. I put the evidence, I put the documents on the table. Today, they haven't been dealt with. In fact, one of the central characters to the drama um, was removed from remand, whilst some of us who are on remand on, on trumped up charges are still there. Uh, the issue that I have now joined politics and I'm urging parties to overthrow the government, it's a lie by the government because I've never done that and I've never said that. Uh, what I've said is that the government should respect the rule of law. The government should implement political and economic reforms in order for investors, both local and international, to come and invest in Zimbabwe and create jobs in order for the tax base to grow, in order for us to have uh, good hospitals and good schools and in, in order for people to have water in their homes. And when you say this and you give examples to the citizen, of why the suffering is caused directly by the lack of implementing political reforms. The government then turns around together with its political surrogates and call you a political activist. In journalism, we are interacting, as I said much earlier, with politics every day. I cannot avoid talking about politics if I'm talking about corruption, because at the heart of corruption are political elites. So if I'm afraid uh, of being called a political activist, uh, then I will not report about uh, corruption. And it's important for senior journalists, especially like yourself and myself and Alex, to look at where the problem is. The problem is partly to do with the training, which Alex talked about, that it was sort of um, uh, choreographed in such a way that journalists don't deal with issues they deal with events. When I was training at the Zimbabwe Institute of Mass Communications, we were being told by uh, the former Minister of Information, uh, Dr. Nathan Shamirira, that we should focus on developmental journalism, where President Mugabe goes to rural areas, donates maize, and then we should focus on that. But at that same time, cars were being uh, uh, taken out of will of our political elites, were looting uh, uh, the, the, the fiscars, and because we are being told to focus on development of journalism, people who are in journalism are now afraid to focus on the criminality of the political elites because they will be labeled political activists. At this point, I've come to embrace it, whether they call me an activist or not, what is important is the information that I've put on the table. That is what strengthens me as a journalist. And that's the only currency that I have the truthfulness of what I've put on the table. Did I lie that money was looted um, during the, 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 the COVID-19 uh, pand pandemic? Did I lie that the president's niece had done a corrupt deal where she was not going to be denied bail, it was going to be unopposed? Those are the things that matter. Whether they call me a political activist for saying those things, well, is their choice. But if we look at, um, the kind of things that then follow after our reports, it shows you that we are just journalists. Obedaya Moe was fired. Today, uh, the vice president, Kembo Mohadi, was, was, uh, was um, asked to fall on his sword because of the work that journalists are doing. Yep. Um, how, Opal, how does it feel? How does it feel um, after, you know, reporting about something and then um, in the COVID get, uh, you know, ended up the minister uh, being fired or removed from cabinet. And recently we have seen the first resignation of a sitting vice president in Zimbabwean history because of journalism. How does it feel? And, and, and as Opal answers this question, um, um, uh, maybe if there's anyone uh, on, on, on the platform who wants to have a question or a comment, can you please just show by raising your hand or I will be forced to, to conscript you. Well, I think um, journalism uh, is, is the work of journalists to put out information in the public domain. And it is the work of citizens to then uh, uh, ask their government to do the right thing. When we wrote about the looting of COVID-19 public funds uh, last year, 
I expected the president to immediately fire uh, the health minister because the evidence was irrefutable. It was there on the table. My biggest disappointment actually was that it dragged on for so long, which means that the president was not interested in getting rid of this guy, but the pressure just became too much. In the Kembo Mohadi uh, saga, I think he went quickly because I think there are other underlying issues. Uh, it's not just about the sexual scandal is itself, but I think there are other political elements that are at play. But ordinarily, Kembo Mohadi should have gone immediately when these revelations were exposed by Zim Live because the evidence was on the table. He said it was not true. Obviously, he was lying because he has gone. He wouldn't have gone if uh, the audio uh, 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 pieces that were put on uh, out by Zim Live were contrived. He wouldn't have gone if uh, his voice had been cloned, but he's gone because the audios are truthful, they are factual. So the fact that it took him so long to go, to me again, it's worrisome because it shows that our leadership, our political leadership in Zimbabwe does not understand the need and the importance for them to live an upright life, especially where one is accused of sleeping with people who are supposed to be protecting him, people who are married to his subordinates. He should have just gone immediately. Okay, I, I was just going to make a comment, um, Shanga, that uh, it would have been nice to have the two gentlemen who have put across their point of view very clearly, uh, but uh, uh, who, are, who are seemingly on one side, who are very critical. Do we have someone here uh, who uh, is pro-establishment, who can defend the establishment <laughs> as far as the media is concerned? Because obviously Hopewell and Alex uh, are critical, oh which is why it comes, they're called activists. Like the establishment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, am it's amazing that we didn't we didn't know the position that they were going to they were going to take. Um, so uh, it, it becomes uh, difficult to to look for panelists um, who, who already have a position that you know. But um, Moses, you want to come through? Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, I think I have one or two last questions directed to Mr. Opochingono again. All right, sir. So uh, what is your what is your take on the issue of sanctions imposed upon Zimbabwe, which, which has been there for over twenty years now? And what is what is it that you have to say concerning them? And uh, since it appears to me that you you are actually have going to be to 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 catch the attention of the international community, why then don't you uh, what what is actually uh, stopping you actually to stand in uh, to, for the interests of Zimbabweans in challenging the international community for the whatever that we are experiencing here, uh, or maybe for uh, before you answer that, maybe you should actually maybe address the issue of sanctions on what's your position on the issue of sanctions imposed upon Zimbabwe, the efficacy of it upon Zimbabwean economic and development. Yeah, um, I, I I would um, I'll allow Hopol if you if you may if you please to answer that, but. Uh, it is not. Yes, um, it is not in line with our topic. But yeah, you. Um, since you are here. Yeah, um, I, it seems the gentleman has not been paying attention to what I've been saying uh, for the past three years. I've written extensively, uh, and this material is available online if you look for it, on sanctions. And I've said that uh, sanctions are not good for Zimbabwe. Um, but I've also written about what needs to be done for sanctions to go. If any political leader has got the interests of Zimbabweans at heart, they should ask themselves why sanctions are there. In fact, I was one of the uh, journalists after the coup who said, let's give Emerson Nangagwa a chance because he came out and said the issues that are being talked about in the sanctions against Zimbabwe in Zidera are issues that are genuine. He said it himself that um, it is important for Zimbabwe to address those issues because they don't actually save America, they save Zimbabweans. So any leader who cares about Zimbabwe will stop killing people, will stop abusing uh, state institutions, 
will investigate where it had the matter went because those are the issues that are, are being raised in these um, sanctions. And Emerson Mnangagwa himself, the, the video is there online, said that he was going to address those issues because they were important. And at that point in time, before the elections of 2018, he actually said Zimbabweans should not worry about sanctions because they will go away by, by his actions. And those actions, we have not seen them. Sanctions will go away if we stop killing each other, if we stop using violence against those that don't agree with us, if we stop using institutions like the police and the judiciary to persecute our, our, our adversaries, political adversaries or journalists. Why is it a problem that you would want uh, that kind of regime of killing people to continue and yet you are quick to say sanctions must go, but you are not quick to say that the killing of citizens should stop. Six people were killed on August 1 in 2018. Those are part of the issues that are being raised by people who are sanctioning us. And we must understand that sanctions are an eloquent statement by those governments that are implementing them. They address their interests we should be asking ourselves whether we are doing the right thing to address our own interests. We can shout all we want against sanctions, but they will not go away because it's not us who imposed them. It's another government that imposed them. They have a right to not want to associate with us if we don't adhere to certain values. And those values cannot be compared like what others do to say, but what about Saudi Arabia? What about ism does not work because you are saying, please allow me to kill my people the same way you allow Saudi Arabia to kill its own people. If you were to ask citizens whether they would want those issues that were raised in the sanctions regime to be addressed, the answer would be yes. In fact, that's the ticket that the vice president then, uh, Emerson Munangagwa, used to ingratiate himself with the, with the citizen. He said that sanctions are being used by the Mugabe regime to cover up its failures. So what has changed now? Let's implement the right for people to be respected, to, to, to respect the constitution, to stop killing people, to stop abusing state institutions, to stop using the Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe as a piggy bank. And those are the issues that are being asked of us to do. Is there anything wrong with us addressing those issues? The answer is no. Everything will change and the quality of life will change for Zimbabweans. Why would we want to continue killing each other? Why would we want not to prosecute those that kill others? Those are the questions that I've been asking. I'm against sanctions and I've written about it, but I also don't approach the issue of sanctions with a, with a one line mentality. I approach it in such a way that I say, let's resolve the issue. How can it be resolved? It will be resolved when we start respecting our constitution. So why can't we respect our constitution? Amazing, thank you very much, Hopo. Herbert? Hello. Um, yes, so thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody. For me, it's not a question, it's just a comment. Um, just to, because I jumped in a bit late, but uh, I really applaud um, the Mr. Moderator for, for this. And uh, for me, firstly, is to uh, congratulate the media fraternity for the journalists uh, for their uh, expose, you know, I think it's the first of its kind, and um, uh, we applaud e efforts by everybody to uh, at least to reach at this stage. I just hope and I wish the, we could have a lot of this coming so that at least uh, we can see some change. So, um, I am not a journalist, but I'm a political scientist, and uh, I'm in the humanitarian sector, and that means that uh, I I'm so much worried in, by the situation in the country in terms of uh, especially the issues that Hopewell uh, have been really like writing on in terms of uh, you know corruption, COVID, fun, looting. The situation in the hospitals is not, is not pleasing at all. Uh, the humanitarian situation is not good at all. We know the situation of our health uh, delivery system. And the more we speak, the more we talk about this, really it is going to, to help us all. Um, I just wished and hoped that we, we could have more 
uh, officials, uh, even ministers, uh, you know, uh, getting exposed and then taking this. Uh, whilst uh, the resignation is, uh, is something uh, uh, which I think is good, but I still think that uh, what more for those that we don't know, what more for other sectors which we, we, we don't know about and which has not been exposed. So I really would like to, 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 to applaud uh, the media fraternity, the journalists, uh, for, 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 for doing this good work. Uh, the, the, the main issue also, which I would like to just touch on in, in terms of uh, the laws in the country, in terms of uh, uh, the, the, the issues, how come this situation is not taking would like, is also because of uh, uh, the fear that was also talked about, you know, the, the issue of the judiciary, when you look at uh, uh, the state apparatus, so the, 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 the atmosphere itself is not conducive for general persons or for anybody to freely speak or to freely, everybody in Zimbabwe, unfortunately, if you point out or if you say something contrary to the, you know, to the government perception, uh, you are labeled an, an, an activist, which is, I think is very, very unfortunate. So uh, thank, thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Herbert Mutubuki. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we are uh, running fast, running out of time. Right. So early on, uh, before we got into this interview, we went to the streets uh, to ask the people of Zimbabwe to ask people what do they think about free speech in Zimbabwe and how it's affecting their daily lives. And uh, this is what they had to say. Just um, after this. I will ask my panelists to give me uh, their closing remarks. Okay. Um, thanks for the question. But I think it is indeed uh, threatening the freedom of speech in Zimbabwe. Uh, most people are afraid of coming out in the open even if they see the big chefs machita corruption because they are not sure what will happen after they, they speak out this therefore has caused a lot of um because when someone sees okay Look at what happened Nana Chingono and others. I'm just giving an, an example. But what then happened to him? That is number one thing. Chuku kwenye rati corruption ni rambe chitika. Endeva na sata ora kunyango wa chiziwa. Kunyango wa wona shume shume shwa. Kunyango wa wona. People are afraid of of speaking out. So I think there must be some kind of. Um, Understanding from the top. Utikana muna kauya agataura utinda wana shakati. Ngasa ngasa fila kuchka. Look at other countries like South Africa. Look at other countries like uh, uh, another Zambia and another Tanzania. Someone can just speak out. This is what is happening. Let's correct this. If we are to take those points that people say and we correct corruption without th threatening people's lives because we have got everything around but enough resources because corruption and so I think there's no freedom of speech. That's what I think. Hey, you go to that. 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 You go to that.
Vas-y, vous dites quoi, Divan Non, quand on est en Okuti, on m'a mou, on a chata ou la chocolade. Chocolade, chili chocolade, chocolade. Chichata, ça compte, vous pouvez vous dire chocolade. Ça va, je ne sais pas, 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 Si nous ne tout tirer mes rayis, pas pour la main. On a un autre. Parce que tout le chien m'a dit de ta police à quoi on a mon état. C'est de ta police à quoi on a ou un autre. À nos policiers de table, table de l'homme, tour à la fin de l'anneau. Qui t'a dit d'un bout de ce que tu sais. Père. On va courir à ce que nous traitons à Pagoutor à Bédouan. On va l'autre tour de Chakat Chakat et Chakachat à Chirpiti Gamoniga. Vargas Oguma, Wako Kusunga, Saga, would you express a freedom of speech? I think the Bassina was in what I would do. I go on Yiga would eat Chikadai, or no beer, but Dogatora, same material to Uru and Yan, Magumogan also tomorrow, Sunga Saga, not upon the Risa Wutiji, should I go excited with this? In the Gadona, corruption in Yagadi, Rimos Ganyan. Especially Karabona, not hanging up even can have got me to watch. To consult our children is repeating our consult out. Moving goes, come to go tower and those repeating it. As I'm telling Tunga combustion with Toro and Ungori Power Papa as Minisaka to Kala. As I put as I want to see Ah, so you get better with my papa and I didn't look down as the younger my one. Kamu itu ngurus kamu jangan jauh dari tiga orang batu kaparoid itu. Kamu dah untuk cara mari pawai setan ini. Kamu itu punya soalan dah mahu ni apa? Sangat ni polis jet. Kamu tu jangan degun. Kamu suka kaparoid di batu sejuk tu bukan jangan. Kamu jangan. Kamu batu bodi. Kamu ni mara jangan ngurus story ni apa dah jauh. Kamu untuk cara mari tu. Tu 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 yang dah cepat cara. Kamu tu muda. Kamu tu mana? Kamu tu cepat mari. Kamu tu yang dah guna cara mari. Kamu tu cara faham berapa jam apa? Kata. Aku rasa ni tu semua. Mau anjing gaya tu, harus ada om. Apa tu tunggu cendawan nunggu masuk je. Agam kisah murid siapa macam boleh dah jadi. Apa tunggu dia tulis tu sendan. Tunggu cendawan. Nayo presiden tu agak tunggu anak saya kita. Kita tunggu tu sendiri kita show. I think this is my opinion. Um, I will just ask um, uh, Alex, uh, your your concluding remarks uh, just in a, under a minute. Yeah, I think it's 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 good to continue with these discourses uh, that matter. Blessed, thank you for this platform, and it's also good to have uh, passionate people, experienced people uh, like the ones you have brought, um, Koma Wopo, in, in this respect. I think if there is optimism, there is hope, uh, there is a light a ray of light uh, in the dark. Uh, corners of uh, this country of Zimbabwe, I think we'll make it and corruption should fall. Corruption is our number one enemy. Thank you Nkoma Opo for the work you are doing. Continue doing so. Thank you more importantly for the work that you're doing, training our journalists. It's very important because I can see the difference between people that are properly trained and people that are not properly trained. And I want the citizens to understand that journalism um, is not about uh, getting likes and retweets as has been characterized by the uh, state and its surrogates when they are insulting us. It is about bringing out the truth. It is about putting out information in order to assist citizens to make the right decisions when they are uh, thinking about what to do when it comes to issues of public life. It is about helping people to make the right decisions when it comes to voting for those that will go and represent them for the next five years. And that is the job of the journalists. Our job is not to fight with politicians, it's just to put out information there. Where we get things wrong, we apologize and, and, and because we are human. And uh, it's also important for the politicians to understand that it is important to engage with journalists from time to time. It helps to remove and ease the tension that has been created uh, in the past 20 years where the journalists have been perceived and characterized and caricatured as enemies of the state. We are not enemies of the state. We are actually patriots. Amazing. Uh, can you give us two bars before you leave, Opo? 
them loot, them loot, them loot, them loot. <laughs> Thank you, amazing. This program was brought to you proudly by uh, Frederick Newman Foundation in partnership with Heart and Soul TV and Radio. And I had an amazing cast of guests, experienced journalists uh, whose shoes I do hope to feel. Um, amazing insights there and thank you very much to our guests who were with us in studio although uh, virtually for uh, adding into this conversation journalism is the bulwark uh, to defending democracy journalism is a tool for social change and development and it is not an enemy of the state it should not be considered a weapon um, and also the state should instead of seeing it um, as an enemy should consider it as a partner if they truly want uh, to fight and curb uh, corruption. Now here at Heart and Soul TV and Radio, we believe in free talk, free speech, and in part, together with our partners. And we hope that we will meet again in our next episode where we are looking at the political space, the economy, and free speech in the political space. And thank you very much, Opal, for the amazing uh, uh, insights that you have shared with us this, this, uh, this evening. And Alex, thank you very much. Mkoma John Masuku, uh, thank you very, very, very much. And to our lovely and always supportive uh, audience in Zimbabwe, thank you. My name is Blessed Mtlanga, Dara Bless. And till next time. Thank you. We'll leave you listening to this amazing song by one uh, of our own artists in Zimbabwe. Hope we'll sing on. Demlut, demlut. This is Free Talk in partnership with Frederick Newman Foundation, our partners in free speech. Free speech is the center of development of any nation. Them loot, 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 them loot